Good day, everybody. Uh, welcome to our last webinar of 2020, uh, the year everybody wants to see go. Uh, so, our Darlene Tips and Tricks webinar for December. We're going to do a Worldwide Technology Meeting 2020 recap. So, <clears throat> even though it was a virtual event, I don't think you know there were a lot of you that were able to attend. I know it's a it's a huge dedication of time. So, like I've tried to traditionally do the last few years is Kind of just cover some of the key points that's a it's a multi-day event so can't really cover everything but i wanted to touch on kind of just some of the more important or interesting things i saw some of the stuff we're going to cover in maybe webinars uh coming up in the future uh, you'll have the duo event coming up hopefully probably in the virtual format um, similar to what they did uh for the meeting itself um but you know i wanted to uh bring up something uh those of you that were able to attend, I, hopefully, I think the ones I've spoken to all feel similar to that. I think Darlene did an excellent job of putting together this virtual event. They used a product uh, called uh, AirMeet to do it. it, gave it kind of a nice conference feel. Uh, if you have to do some kind of conference with a large group of people, I would definitely suggest uh, looking at it. Again, that's AirMeet. Um, not selling their product or anything. I, I just thought it was a good experience and something that we're going to actually look at uh, this year for a couple of events we're doing <clears throat> on the semi editing virtual publish side, especially. <clears throat> so, uh, so definitely wanted to compliment Darlene. I thought, you know, the event felt as uh, kind of tangible as, as it could. It felt real to us. And uh, the camera equipment that Darlene used and the way they edited everything really made it feel um, as Good as you could, I think. I think they did an excellent job. Um, so first thing to come from the event, I think the big news is ES6 is now actually official starting uh, December 1st. Uh, the official release is out. Uh, contact us if you're wanting to get your hands on it, uh, start testing it. Uh, we do have some things we need to discuss with it and upgrade paths and Alex has been working on some of that. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. So ES6 is official, so you know, a little celebration there. It's been a long time in coming for those of us that have been following it, going back a couple of worldwide technology meetings. <clears throat> so what we're going to talk about today is uh, going to go over some of the ES6 new features. Um, because it has been a while in coming, you know, through Duo's worldwide technology meeting 19, um, <clears throat> the webinars we've done. We've covered some of the new features. Uh, some of them would be familiar, so I didn't want to kind of rehash that. I'm trying to keep this webinar a little bit short because uh, I know everybody's ready to start holidays and stuff. Um, so just going to try to cover some of the stuff they touched on that is kind of new to, to ES6 that either I wasn't necessarily aware of or uh, been refined a little bit. And we'll cover those, including the project planning stuff um, that now is finally ready to go. It is. It was the biggest holdup in keeping ES6 uh, from being released let, uh, in the summer when it was due. <clears throat> uh, we're going to go over an ES6 dam experience, um, which I think most of you will find interesting, and it's uh, interesting to see what can actually be done with ES6 when you put your mind to it. Uh, going to go over uh, ES connector plugin. Uh, when we get to that, you'll see why that's interesting later on, and Something, uh, what they call them basic tools, well, they call them microservices. Um, so it's basically using basic tools as microservices. Uh, as you could do Dalim events, or maybe you've been on calls with Dalim, you may have heard them talk about Dalim Drive or Direct Drive. Um, and uh, that's kind of what these microservices are. This is kind of interesting future stuff. Uh, so we're going to touch on that. Now, obviously, with Worldwide Technology Meeting, they always go over what is going to be covered, uh, you know, what is being released, what's current, and they really try to uh, bring in some of the future. And some of the stuff that you're going to be seeing is a bit future uh, ESX type stuff, um, but that's what's great about the event. If they do Worldwide Technology Meeting the same way next year, where you can join virtually, I, I highly recommend participating because being able to ask questions of developers as they're doing these presentations, seeing some of the questions that get asked and kind of the, the dialogue that goes back and forth is, is definitely a really good thing to be uh, a part of. And then 
So we'll see a little bit a hair of VSX. I was hoping to be able to show more, but wasn't able to. Um, and we'll talk about Jacques one more thing, which really is now ESX specific and talked about future architecture, which I thought was interesting. Sorry for bored some of you. I know a lot of us are production people, but I'm an architecture guy too. So I thought some of it was interesting and it just brings up thoughts of how things are gonna work in the next couple of years. So first go over some of the new features. Um, you know, some of the stuff, uh, new architectural components, Elasticsearch 6 support, single sign-on stuff, all the stuff that we've talked about the last couple of years that's gonna be coming to, to ES6, the new HTML5 features of dialog with multiple uh, images on screen at one time, up to 16, um, copy and paste, things like that, that we've talked about. The framework on ES6 is changing to uh, EXT JavaScript 6. Um, I think uh, they were running uh, two before, uh, or three, uh, but gives them some more functionality and modern grids, so things that they were able to take advantage of and use for the layout editor and the workflow uh, uh, builder. So they were able to take advantage of that kind of stuff. Also able to use things like that to build the Gantt chart screens that they have, plus responsive column layout. So starting working towards that mobile capability of a better mobile experience than we've had in the past. On single sign-on. Um, so we talked about uh, SAML2 being part of it. I think that was discussed even going back to Duo of uh, 2019. Um, but they've added for ES6's release OpenID and OAuth2. Um, so those are two more supported methods. Interesting thing with uh, one of them is that you're able to actually control the user and the user profile on the single sign-on. I think before with most of the single sign-on stuff you've seen, it's kind of, it uses the default profile to log that user on, but you're able to control the user profile as well. This is documented on the Confluence site. If you don't have a log on to the Confluence site, please contact us, this, this way, especially if you're an API user, this is where you can get all the information on the API stuff, plus other documentation that Domain makes available and keeps updated more than they actually do inside the products. So some list up in Elasticsearch 6 and Kibana 6. I think Alex did a webinar where we covered a little bit of this, but uh, you're looking at faster query times because it can search across several shards. If you have huge indexes, um, it definitely helps in that respect. Um, if you're security minded, you have SSL encryption between the nodes now, and there's a, a SQL and ODBC drivers that you can use for business intelligence solutions. So you're able to dig into the data more from other applications. Um, one thing to note, and Alex will be doing, if he hasn't done it already, I'm not sure if he's finished this, um, he's gonna be doing the video on basically the upgrade path for Elasticsearch, because Elasticsearch is only um, backwards compatible one version. So if you started your ES life with Elasticsearch 5, um, so basically, um, ES55, you should be okay to upgrade from that to Elasticsearch 6 with your ES6. If you go back further uh, with Elasticsearch and you started with an Elasticsearch 2.2.x or, or before even, there's you're going to have to completely re-index everything and actually bring in the uh, index new because of this. Again, Alex is gonna be making a video on it. We also documented it, so everybody has that documented and can go that. We're always here to help you with that kind of stuff as well. In, in Kibana 6, there's gonna be CSV exports of your charts now. Uh, there's machine learning capabilities. Uh, I think it's really interesting, and I think this was a paid feature before in Kibana 5, but application platform monitoring and XPAC monitoring um, so you actually will be able to do monitoring of your infrastructure itself, the, your VMs or your physical machines, your bare metal machines, uh, look at CPU utilization, RAM utilization, send notifications based on that, 
all in Cabana. So you wind up with one platform to do all of your um, charts and everything from your usage of ES to your infrastructure itself. So really a nice addition and we'll probably be doing a, a thorough um, webinar on this sometime later this year as we delve more into it. So on the JD up device side, um, Linux and OSX pretty much stay the same. You have file monitoring on any physically attached storage, um, and that includes metadata insertion and driving the application via AppleScript and other scripting languages. Uh, big news there is Windows is back. So we had file monitoring kind of in, for Windows, but it never worked uh, consistently. I think that Mike Moscato lost the rest of his hair because of this. Um, but uh, it is back now, works on attached storage, does not handle metadata insertion, no, but it does handle the file monitoring of attached storage, but also handle driving things like GMG and in InDesign server directly. Uh, so connection types, so, so SFTP is now supported both on input channels and storage volumes. Uh, so it just gives us a little bit more security on how we're mounting things. Um, I don't know if uh, Jude or any of my guys in SA has been sold on, SFT, on F, F, FTP, which was what we had before as being the main thing you should use for your storage volumes as opposed to uh, just you know physical mounts. But uh, Christoph Bimler definitely pushed that. Um, they think it's a good solution to use it for some of their larger customers in Europe, for sure. Some of our customers here in the U.S. are using it as well. Um, so SFTP being added to it is definitely nice to have. On the CMIS side, um, we're used to it with the Adobe Conductor stuff. Um, uh, WebDAV is now released in official. We haven't put it through its paces yet. Our initial testing, which goes back probably to the first part of this year, well, should, but my last testing, which goes back to the first part of this year, because I hadn't had a version that worked in, uh, seemed like it was very slow and I had issues with um, basically saving over a file, uh, did create revisions, it just kind of confused the yes, it seemed like. So I'm anxious to actually get this tested, put through its paces. Now that I have a couple of weeks coming up uh, at the end of the year that I should be slow, I should be doing this and get my hands more in ES6. And, if I find anything interesting with it, I'll definitely send emails out just to kind of update y'all and let y'all know where my progress is on that. So currently in uh, ES6, you have Dropbox and Amazon S3, which we've had for a while support. The Amazon S3, as uh, Christoph has brought up, is more stable now than it was before. I think the only things I saw before, I think it was pretty stable, but I did have sometimes issues with the monitoring and the monitoring setup. So that's changed a little bit and it's supposed to be more stable. Um, you have Dropbox and they're currently working on Azure Blob Storage and Google Cloud Storage as well as Box. So you're working on other things. And basically these are just mounting them as file system views inside of EOS. So you can use them to drop files, run your workflows, um, anything like that that you need to do. Something that they brought up interesting, they didn't delve much into this, but apparently there's uh, gonna be a plugin available uh, that'll work with only Office and allow you inside of ES to an ES plugin component to do native editing of Word documents, Excel, PowerPoint, whatever you have inside of uh, ES. So I thought that was interesting and this is something that we're gonna kick the tires on when they actually have all the pieces. And some of this stuff isn't coming out until later, early in the year. Um, but I thought this would be interesting. We'll probably do a webinar if it becomes interesting enough. So Latitude's been updated, now has HTTPS support, has a new SSL certificate. Check in, check out should work better with it than it was working before. Works on both Windows and OS X. Um, there is a warning there that if you have a complex security environment with proxy servers and stuff, there could still be some issues and we can kind of help you with those and we'll put them to Dolly and see if we can get around those. Just let us know on that. Uh, nice addition to search um, that actually most customers should be happy with. Um, 
originally or you know up until now in ES55, you've basically only been able to change that whether your searches work as an or or and uh, inside the user profile itself. So an administrator would kind of make these decisions for their users or the user would have to ask the admin to make these changes in their profile uh, to change the search behavior. That has changed, it's now in the search screen itself um, where they can actually choose or and, and they've actually added exact or fuzzy searches. So more ability for users to control their experience and find easily the images that they're looking for instead of like putting roadblocks in their way. Document step, uh, this has maybe been covered before, but wanted to bring this back up. Uh, so in the document step, you're able to control your revision. So you can now put a document step at the end of your document workflows and possibly delete previous revisions of the file. So as some of us know, if you're working inside an ES project and you're, you know, you may have five, 10 revisions possibly of a PDF file that sometimes can be a pretty sizable file. Uh, other than deleting it until now, you basically kept all of your uh, revisions. So you had 10 times the file size on that plus previews, uh, uh, XML and everything else that Darlene stores with it, uh, taking up a lot of space. Now, if you want, you have the ability to put that document step at the end, clean up the previous revisions and only keep, keep the final release version of the file especially for archiving stuff, you may want to do it that way. So if you have an archiving tool at the end um, with ArcAware, you can just archive that final file and not all the pieces that went with it. Your choice, and obviously you can change that behavior in the workflow. You can make it interact with the project workflow if you want to actually trigger that kind of stuff. Um, also in the sharing um, tool itself, you now have the ability to actually share out a soft proof link as well, besides the view and download. So soft view of the virtual book itself. Pixel conversion tools had some uh, changes to it. It now accepts both vector and raster files, uh, has more output formats, kind of mimicking more of what like uh, the image action tool does in Twist. And it can be reconfigured to crop and convert files. So you can do cropping inside of the one tool. And it does insert the metadata of the file into the image, which I believe it didn't do before. Um, again, this was uh, something we've discussed, but definitely wanted to bring up again is the Java dialog is completely gone, doesn't exist anywhere, I don't think, inside of ES6 anymore. And that's because the virtual book viewer is HTML5 based. Um, basically, looks just like your virtual book soft roof would look. You're able to do all the enrichment and stuff inside of there, and it's completely WYSIWYG. So, what you see is what you get. And you're basically soft proofing it as you're viewing your enrichments, uh, which is really nice for those that want to do that. It maybe makes it a more viable tool uh, for you to extend out to some of your customers. because. Uh, before with the Java based version, it was definitely cumbersome to try to teach um, users how to use it. Some couldn't even run it, depending on the browser and security settings and that. So definitely nice that it's in here and maybe we can extend that out to more customers. And it now handles uh, folding cover simulations. Um, and this is something that kind of handled behind the scenes before, but uh, you had to kind of hack it to do it. Now there's a way to actually get it to do it, which uh, will be nice. And we'll demo this uh, sometime in the beginning of next year, probably. So the, the viewer itself, um, a couple of additions. Again, I mentioned earlier that, you know, we know already that you can do, you know, up to 16 images uh, if you want to use that many raster engines side by side, up and down. Um, and you're able to do copy paste and there's you know, just some additions like that that have you know definitely made it a nicer tool but they actually added a couple more to it uh, that I think were all you know nice additions so we'll cover those so one is a custom statuses for annotations so until now you've had checkable statuses uh, but now uh, using an XML file similar to what you would do for the old soft roofing marks um, 
you're able to actually change what your statuses are. So you see here they have examples to do, approved, done. It basically has the same behavior as the classical checkbox stuff, uh, but you're able to add more to it. And you can create as many as you want. So again, that's an example of the, the XML file. And it does have support for different languages, which doesn't typically, other than the Deep South uh, and maybe uh, you know French Canadian stuff, doesn't matter that much here. But in Europe, is actually you know, obviously a big feature. And it just shows more. So you set the custom status pretty easily and available to everybody. Uh, if there's no XML file, it just defaults to the normal checkbox behavior. And for proofreading marks, they've done a little addition here. So obviously, we, we talk, just talked about how the XML file was used before to create your own custom proofreading marks, uh, where you could upload and you know put an icon associated with it, and it's you know what it does, what it says. Um, they now came up with kind of quicker way to do it that's similar proofreading mark stamp behavior. Uh, being able to create your own custom, what they call PRMs or proofreading marks. These are just basically text uh, marks. So you're able to, in the interface itself, create one, add it from the text. Uh, it could be controlled by the user rights so other users can see it and works just like the proofreading mark, except it's just text. So you create your own and you see here hide change or hide contrast, whatever. It may be created quickly, you have them, and then you can duplicate it and still have it instead of having to like copy and paste the same text annotation all over the place. So, a nice addition. Copy two, we talked about, you know, uh, I think all of you probably have seen the copy paste functionality that they were adding to ES6, and that is there, but there's also now an enhancement to it, which is copy to and choosing all the pages you want to copy it to. So before what they had shown, you'd actually have to copy and paste and paste it onto every image or page you would want to have that associated with. Now you can choose which pages or which images you want and do a quick paste to all of them. So twist, you know, what's new in twist? Um, as I get into this, you know, one thing I want to bring up, and um, I think later in my presentation, you'll see what they've actually been doing with Twist. Uh, we haven't seen necessarily a lot of touch and feel features, uh, new GUI or new web link or anything like that. But there's a good reason why, and we'll see that later. So there's only a couple of things to discuss here, but let you know that there's definitely hard at work with Twist. Um, so one is support of XPath uh, inside the separate from XML tool, XPath 2.0, I should say. Um, so definitely something that a few of my customers have been asking for that will be that is available now in ES6. Um, SFTP input and output support is there, and they've added additional logging to PowerTrap, which is a hidden function in the editor. Uh, to enable it, because obviously you can fill up uh, a lot of logs with that. Uh, but if you're troubleshooting PowerTrap, um, that's definitely there. And you know, going going back to you know what they've actually been doing with Twist, and that's not to say they haven't been working on the current version. Just most of it's typically under the hood. Um, so things like PowerTrap and improving tracking constantly, and doing things like GAMP Group Support 2015, uh, adding um, additional features to pre-flight profiles, for instance, uh, font size option stuff, things like that, and always improving the normalization engine. So improved flattening algorithm for PDFs. Um, so def quicker, which is really probably uh, you know being also a twist user, not just a uh, not just a reseller and you know integrator of it, but actually using it for our own purposes with SemiAd, uh, which is a SaaS solution. We need quick uh, normalization. Uh, the quicker is a big part of it. Better quality, obviously, is always important. So that was good to see in there. And um, we have a lot of fun sample files that have uh, 
choked up or, you know, when I say choked, uh, we have a very minimal time. We need things to process on through semi app. So I'm curious to see what the improvement is going to be on some of these. So get on to uh, the project plan, what's been added uh, uh, inside of that. Raphael did a, a nice presentation on that. Uh, he's definitely kind of the go-to guy for Dalim on, on doing the project planning stuff. It's definitely answered a lot of Mike and I's questions, analysis questions on, on the project planning stuff. And he's a great resource, great guy. So as you know, the planning tool is composed of or, or you probably should know by now since we've been showing it for a while, uh, Gantt chart, workload, and a Kanban. Uh, I think you could also add to this calendar functions. So the Gantt chart itself, it looks like this. If you've ever worked inside of a Microsoft project, you're familiar with Gantt charts like this, chart out your project. And this is actually the job ticket inside of a project itself. So this is associated to a single project. Uh, there's a smart view you can create with this that'll show multiple projects as well. I probably should have included, included a screenshot of that in here. Uh, but nice view of your project timeline when it's due, uh, what the different milestones are, how long each of those take. Very nice view. If you're a production person, you might not care about this at a micro level, but you know, definitely from the management side or uh, if you're managing the department for sure or the CSRs, definitely be able to take advantage of views like this. Then you have the workload function at the bottom now. So this gets more into the management side where you will see the resources that are associated with the project, how much of their time is devoted to this project, if they're overextended between the projects they're on, all that one nice view inside of here, again, inside either a, an overall smart view or a specific uh, project smart view job ticket. And then the Kanban, which is a user smart view. The user can use this to progress where they're at with the file, uh, indicate that basically you can have your logic in your document workflow set that if they actually even you know, uh, not started. So photo selection being the task that's there on the left, if that is actually for a group, uh, whoever picks it up and puts it in their Kanban in progress, they could all make automatically be associated with that file at that time. Things like that can be done with this where they show the progress where they're at and being able to update the progress of the project as a whole based on their campaign, which is definitely a very nice function. So one thing to note that's been added to this is the documents in the document workflow can now be participants of the project workflow. What that means basically is before you know, we've had the send and wait events, which can communicate back and forth between a special project and document workflow to say, hey, I expect this event to happen five times because I'm expecting five documents. And that can communicate back to the wait event that's waiting for that event to happen five times before it progresses the project on. Well, in this case, what it's doing is it's communicating back to the project based on the milestone that's set up for however many files are in the document, the project. So if I have 10 projects, or if I have 10 files, my project workflows percentage is updated based on the progress of those 10 files. If another five files come in, it adjusts itself. And so it would have maybe been at 50%, five more files come in that are at the beginning. Well, now it's at 40%. Um, because you've realized less of those 15 files now instead of 10, for instance. So communication back and forth, you still have to now manually approve the project milestone to move it forward because obviously even if you reached 100%, you don't know if new files aren't meant to come in. Um, so they have it manually set to approve. That may change in the future, it could add to it, but definitely nice to be able to have that communication and the updating of your project milestone and your Gantt charts based on that. So this just shows more of that, the document approval step, uh, updating what the document approval and the project workflow status is and how that changes your Gantt chart. Uh, 
So to do that, they do have new user profile setting to allow a person to be a widget participant um, and add them as a participant. Something that a few customers were concerned about, uh, ES6 prototypes, betas, alphas, whatever the different versions we've been able to show over the last couple of years have been, um, show the schedule tab gone completely, uh, pushing everybody to the new project management and uh, Gantt charts and that. Schedule tab is back. Uh, you will have to, by default, it's gonna be turned off, uh, but you can enable it under the user profile, uh, turning, making sure to turn the new project management off. It's one or another, you can't use both because there's different behaviors under the hood on that. Um, but just know that if you currently use the old schedule function where this happens one day before and this happens absolutely on this day kind of stuff, and that, that logic was fine for you, you don't care about Gantt charts, it's there, it's back. Um, and just make sure that you have your settings correct to use one of the other. There is, as Dalim is moving forward uh, towards the ESX life, um, everything is API first in their mind. So there is a full API for the planning. And again, on the Confluence page, that's completely documented. So if you're a developer yourself and you want to use the API or you just want to use API calls to call things maybe from uh, you know, your, your CMS or you know, um, your management systems, you can do that and make calls and move the progress of an ES project from outside of ES itself. So one thing I wanted to do, uh, the next section coming up, that was kind of all the stuff in, in ES6 new features that either coming soon or you're using straight out your know, box uh, day one as you install the official version. Um, the next section I'm going to be covering is going to have some ESX type stuff, some stuff that uh, will be coming soon in ES6, but I wanted to define a couple of things that are going to be mentioned a little bit beforehand. Uh, one of those is GraphXL. So GraphXL is kind of a, it's a query language for APIs. So it's used highly coming up in ESX um, and basically just makes calling the API easier and it's kind of almost takes over some of the functions of of what the app server does today a little bit. The app server will still be there, but uh, all the communication to tools will be done using GraphXL, which the, not, I'm not a developer, but the little demos of it I saw are really interesting because it auto-completes um, calls that you're making and helps you kind of fill out and, and use the API itself. Uh, React, you're gonna hear, which is a JavaScript library for building user interfaces. So React is where they're going after the, the EXT JavaScript um, stuff. So it's going to take over for that, which just changed to ES6. But um, we'll actually, in one of the examples coming up, actually be shown working with ES6 uh, to build a completely new user interface based on the API. Material design used with React. Basically, it's a design language used by Google. So React itself doesn't necessarily have a lot of components and tools in it and material design is used with that. Dalin also used material design to build some of their own components, um, you know, things like the search screen that they could be using in the SX and a few of the things like that um, done in material and added to the material design library. Docker, uh, this is gonna be for kind of Jacques presentation that I'm gonna talk about. Uh, basically Jacques is, is containers that you've probably heard this, you know, using containers uh, that basically is virtualization to what's being called a Docker container. Um, so instead of like VMware, where the VMs are running as completely separate OSs right underneath the hardware shell, um, containers actually run inside with one OS, in, which may be running on a bare metal or a virtual machine. So you have a base OS and then you have inside con containers that exists within that, that each would serve its own kind of application purpose. So you may have a container 
and say ES6 infrastructure wise, you have a container that's your app server, container that's a render server, and all those live in one OS and communicate back and forth. And then Kubernetes, uh, which is the first time I was really hearing much about it, but it can be used with things like Docker and containers. Um, it's open source and used by a lot of like uh, AWS makes this available as, as well as uh, some of the others to automate deployment of containers. So you can basically set metrics in Kubernetes that says, if I reach this threshold on something, launch another container to do it. So uh, we'll see an example of this later with dialog. Um, we'll talk about an example, I should say. So I just wanted to make those kind of aware if you're not familiar or haven't heard the terms, um, obviously defining each one would take a webinar into itself probably, but just a quick idea of what they are. So the first thing I wanted to share of kind of the, the new stuff is uh, an interface that uh, Tim Delia has created um, on top of ES6. Um, so I thought this was a really good exercise um, and seeing what can be done and what Darlene is going to be bringing to the table. Um, uh, Tim is actually a technical lead in what is now Darlene UK. So for those of you that aren't aware, uh, Darlene took over the, um, the distribution channel inside of the UK. Uh, so there is a Darlene UK now. Tim is part of that. He used to work for one of the resellers there. Uh, I've had the pleasure of talking to him at a couple of the Worldwide Technology meetings I've attended. Uh, really sharp guy. Bright, bright guy, great resource for Darlene to have on the team. So what you're about to see, and what I did is kind of just uh, took his hour-long presentation and grabbed some of the most interesting stuff out of it. I'll be talking over it because otherwise his voice would have been chopped up to pieces uh, the way I edited this. Uh, but I'll let him actually talk at the end, answering some questions you all may have. Uh, but he built this interface. Again, on ES6, so on what you're able to get today, uh, using React.js, Material Design, and the Dalim API. Now, there's a little bit of caveat on Dalim API. He actually used API functions that are not necessarily documented to us. Uh, so some under the hood API functions he did have to, to use for this. Uh, nice to be one of the developers there and be able to take advantage of that. But uh, He'll answer some questions on that a little bit later. So this is a presentation. You see ES6 login screen. He's logging in and specific user profile that takes them in to this desktop, basically. So you see the images. It looks different, right? The images slid in. He did some stuff where you can actually, the user has control of his theme. So he's able to choose between a night theme and a day theme. Those two themes were made available by the uh, administrator when he created this look by applying these two themes to it. He's able to change uh, kind of the views from the icon view to list view to a side-by-side -side view. Uh, in the list view, he added something nice in here where the user can actually go in and pick the specific metadata he wants showing up in the columns. Uh, so he's searching here for uh, ratings, I think is what he winds up searching for. Sorry, I was a bit busy this morning, so I didn't get to go through what I'm doing here, but yeah, he's going to search for ratings. So he's looking at all his metadata that the user could choose any of the metadata available to them. And you see he added the column real quickly on there. So you could add whatever other column he wants. Go back to icon view. He's kind of showing the navigation now on the left. If you look at the left, he's choosing there. He's got this slider. So instead of having this kind of go down, barrel down, taking up a lot of space, he actually just did a slide in that actually builds it in. And you see the way he's loading the images where they all kind of slide up. He said that's from a speed standpoint and memory standpoint. It just helps with that kind of stuff. And it's, it's a nice look. If you notice that he's rolling over, the tools actually show up on top of the image to save real estate. Um, I thought that was pretty nice. So the tools show up for a single image. You can select it. In this case, I think he's going to select uh, the color. Finder, so we selected that, automatically pulls up color search there. So instead of having to drag and drop the way you do color search now, he's just doing it there. Now he's doing a quick select of it, and you'll see if he's selected multiple files, it actually shows the tools over on the left-hand side since it's multiple images, and the on top wouldn't matter much. So he's doing that, shows it there, you can quickly view it in dialogue, 
for instance, one click, dialogue is completely themed um, as it should be to match the interface. He's able to edit the metadata quickly, and this is a floating that. So instead of being stuck on the side, you can actually float this, change all the metadata for all the files at once. So any common metadata we show filled out, it's blank as it's different metadata here. It's going to set country code to Germany for all the files that quickly in this little floating tab. So here you can look at that, see all of them that are together. This I can actually see what he's doing here. So all the common metadata shown, user can actually go in, change what metadata he wants to show. And what he's showing right now is actually going to be the uh, the um, proof sheet. So we can actually do a proof sheet real quick, basically in a wussy wig fashion, fashion, fashion. So he's able to show exactly what he wants to see, change the metadata, go to a print view, see it in the aspect ratio it's in, so he can change it to landscape portrait if he wants, and it'll make that change on screen, change the page size, make that change on screen, show it's going to be there. Go straight to a PDF if he wants, and there's a PDF and preview of the contact sheet he wanted to show. So really nice if he's showing the change in metadata on one file, he's able to do it this view. He actually built this uh, talking to customers about what they need out of an asset management view. So it's purpose built, which I thought was nice from a domain standpoint to actually build something that's purpose built. This is a crop tool he actually uh, created inside of here. So crop tool straight to it. You have the tools at the bottom uh, shown, so you can select those, move the file around, uh, crop it, which I think he's getting ready to do. So just by dragging, you can do his crop box. He's got zoom in, zoom out, rotation. Is he getting ready to show? Flip or mirror. All built in. He hits save and he gets a new image with those functions. You can actually change the, the format it's going out at. So somebody can do this from a card standpoint, for, for instance, change lock the aspect ratio, whatever he needs to do. Now we're going to show the side by side view. Again, the tools are on the bottom. You can zoom into each of them. This is kind of the typical one with the film strip at the bottom, but uh, built into this nice display with the tools there so you can solve proof them, whatever you need to do from that. Collections, real easy, select your images, add them to your collection, that you get a temporary collection to start every session, or you can add your own, he's gonna show that in a minute. Usually thinking what he did here is, uh, he did say this is something that they want discussion from customers on what features need to be added to this what other um, applications are there for this for building your own interface so here he's going to show here is actual different collections that the user has available to them you can edit the collections so he's going to edit it and actually change and maybe add who else has access to this so quickly sharing it out to other users um, very quickly inside the interface. And then he's showing now how to upload images. So he's in a project or in a file system view, drags them right onto that. So you no know, clicking the upload screen or anything, he just drags them right where he wants them. Uh, he can remove whichever ones he wants. He can drag more assets there. You see it step folders, upload metadata, little slide out screen built right into it. You can add whatever metadata you want, instructions, uh, pick it up from the documents that are being uploaded. Slide back and forth to that. Then when he gets uploaded, he gets his progress bar across the images, which was pretty fast because he used small. So, what version does this work on? Okay, well, it works on ES6. A lot of the cropping stuff requires ES6 in 
and the plugin and the desktop and everything require ES6. So yes, when can I have it? Okay. So the reason, obviously, there'll be there'll be opinions on features and how many have been added, and you want more features. Um, but at some point, we have to draw the line and say these are the features it's going to have, and we'll add more in different versions. So to get it ready for you, we had to pick a feature set and stick to it. And the good news is, is you can have this in beta on, in January, so you can start to use this. Um, all we ask is, you know, if you take this on as a beta, we really want this to be, give us some feedback, you know. Um, don't take the interface away and just use it and uh, we really want some good feedback. So, you know, if you have any ideas, you have anything, just let us know. Um, can I add new features? You? Um, at the moment, no, it's a pretty sealed product. Um, but it's something that we're thinking more and more about having the ability to use the profile of the user to enable more and more buttons. So the more we add, the more you'll be able to customize it, um, which is obviously important because one of the power, the, the really good things about ES is the ability to add your own custom actions. And yeah, we agree that needs to be possible inside of this with their own eye. And what he adds to that as well is uh, mobile ready is definitely uh, that's what the React helps to. Um, so really interesting. I definitely thought that that everybody would want to see those developments, uh, see what's being done, see what you'll have access to coming up in late January. All right. Uh, so ES Connector, uh, Philippe uh, did a presentation on this and. Uh, what I wanted to bring up with this is, uh, so this is not the CC connector from Silicon Publishing. Uh, this is something that Darlene uh, had created themselves. So again, I couldn't get my hands on it. Um, so I put a short video put together of what they showed. Uh, those of you familiar with CC connector, it's gonna seem very familiar. Uh, obviously there's only so many features you have inside of a plugin that you definitely need to do and that's what they targeted first. Um, so one thing to note, uh, this is compatible with InDesign, Photoshop, Illustrator, 2020 and above. So they did not do it uh, for all the versions. They moved forward because if you know anything about building plugins for um, the CC products, it's an ever-changing target. So going backwards is a complete different uh, way to build a plugin than it is today and moving forward, which will change probably next year as well. So let's see what he's got here. So first of all, you have the plugin there, nice and pretty. He's logged on. You can log on to multiple servers. Uh, when you log on, you have your kind of view of your projects in your file system. So you're able to quickly navigate to those. He's working on the premise here where he's looking for a file that was soft proofed and told needed a revision done of it. So he's shown here, if he had an asset selected, this would show metadata for the asset, links, all of that, the asset ID, the repository, where it's at, all that information I'll show here. I got the impression this wasn't completely finished yet, because this is also going to be something that's available in January. And then he's got the preferences for the plugin. Uh, so things like which repository you're hooked up to, so which ES6 system. This, I think he did say this works with ES5 as well. So now he found his file. He's looking at it. That was the PDF that was annotated. So he's going to go back, find the InDesign file and check out that InDesign file. Um, so with that here, he's able to check it out right at the bottom very easily. And he opened up the InDesign file straight from ES into InDesign. Uh, one of the comments was to modify a background image, I think. So he's doing a search there, finds the background image that he needs to replace finds it quickly with the search capabilities inside the plugin. And replaces that. I guess I kind of edited this down a little bit because uh, it took a lot more time, but did that, update it, he can go in and now export his file as a PDF, making a revision of the previous one. A nice thing, 
is very easy to select the, the PDF uh, presets in here, and you're able to choose that when you export your file, which is a little bit nicer, I think, than the Silicon Publishing one did. That they made it a preference and wasn't that easy to get to. So when he does that, he does create a revision of the file as soon as he does this. Just showing how to do it. Shows the progress, it's uploaded, comes in, and you have a second revision of your PDF. You can go in and view both revisions, uh, just you, you would expect to open either one, place, use either one. And you see here that the uh, InDesign file, since he actually checked it out, is shown locked, shows that it's checked out. And you can see that in the yes coming up in a second. So it shows you there, it's checked out and it's completely locked for him. He can't delete it, he can't do anything with that file. But you can come in here, and uh, just like Silicon Publishing, you do have to save your PDF, uh, your page first, and then check it back in, and you saw it updated. So always make sure to save before updating your revision. And updated it, and now you have two revisions, and it'll update. So everything you want. This is available for Photoshop as well. He didn't show a Photoshop version. As soon as we get our hands on it, probably in January sometime, I'll probably do a, a webinar or just a demo, a quick demo of it, and put video out there for people to see. Um, but uh, some interesting things to note on this. So that'll be available, like I said, in January. Oops, let's go back one. Coming soon, what they're working on is going to be a connector that's compatible with Microsoft Office. Um, so for those of you that need to work in Office, uh, you will be able to with the plugin. Where can you get it? You can get it on www.dalene.com coming up when it's released in January. It is free. Uh, so Dalene is making that available to all ES users and you know obviously your customers as well, um, as long as they register the product. Um, and it's basically an internal development. So it's an internal development team, just like Latitude, building this and going to keep it up. So very nice, very kind of unexpected. We had heard rumors that they may have been working on something, but wasn't sure when it was going to be available. Was very happy to see that. So uh, the plugin, I think, is something a lot of customers wanted to make use of, but definitely got costly at a time. So for them to make this available for free, especially, you know, kudos to Dalene for that. Uh, it definitely shows they listen to their customers and care about their customers. Uh, and they try to rush through some of this because I see I'm running long, always quicker than, always take longer than my rehearsals go. <laughs> but, uh, so microservices, what do they do? What are we talking about? Um, basically, it's basically the individual tools in twist that we're used to today in building our workflows uh, broken out out of twist making them standalone so currently you have you know these different layers um, working with the tools so you have you know the java gui the java interface that that we uh deal with inside of twist in the twist editor you have a layer of tickle that handles the parameter files and uh kind of interpretation between the gui level and the C++ level at the bottom, which is the code that actually runs. Um, what they've done, and going off that, is basically removed that whole tickle layer and made the Java layer API. So each of the tools will have their own API associated with them. Uh, so all the layers are basically merged and the API will talk directly to the C++ code. And they're using GraphQL for that. That's why I brought that up in, in the definition. So it's automatic, it automatically documents itself. It's kind of what I brought up as you type, it's actually bringing it up. The definition of what can be done with it is all built into the API itself. So it makes it really easy to use from a developer standpoint. Um, you talked about uh, Queries and mutations, so queries are asking something to be done. Mutation is actually changing things. Um, and this is basically the code that'll actually drive something like mutation, like a, a image 
conversion type stuff. So this is everything that the API needs to do an image convert, for instance. And basically, those of you who've played with parameter files before, it's it's all the information out of a parameter file that it's just put into uh, you know graphic GraphQL and feeds it feeds the API. We'll kind of quickly get through this one, but you know the, the interesting thing about this is, is we're talking about, and this is again showing what's being called for pre-flight, for instance, pre-flight microservice. Uh, this is where you can start seeing the move towards uh, ESX. So where today we're used to eTwist, and eTwist is a, almost like a separate product that goes along with ES. It's all going to be ES at one point. Each of the tools that we're used to using inside of, of Twist will be a tool inside of an ES workflow. So if you need pre-flight, you don't call a pre-flight workflow, you'll call the pre-flight microservice itself inside of ES. So just breaking those layers off. Um, just to you know, talk to, you know, this is the, the Darlene Drive stuff you've heard maybe mentioned, or anybody body that was part of the World Technology Meeting heard them mention. There's actual implementations of this that they're using at customers, including a couple of customers here in the US. These are customers that, you know, they're dealing with millions of files um, and need speed. And this gives that to them uh, without the kind of uh, the pieces of twist on top of it that actually slow this down because they're dealing with communication between tools. This is just calling the tool direct and definitely just set things up. So trapping, uh, so pre-flight trapping, image conversion, all of those tools have already been converted to this. Next ones they're working on, visual compare, PDF worker, HPE, GMG, and the CR1, CMYK optimizer are all things they're working on in the future. So basically, you know, from the way I understand it, and maybe I need to be corrected on this, is that all of this, all the tools that are necessary, and obviously some of these will be a convergence of tools uh, into one. Like for instance, create PGS and merge XP will be one tool that's all you know, going to be called the same way and pieces of it will be taken out. So it's one program, GraphQL is the interpreter, runs microservices, it's basically called TwistQL is kind of what they're referring it to and it can be called that easy. So you'll see something like this. So the HTTP would be the front end that gets put that's driving this, uh, the GraphQL, that middle layer, and then calling those specific microservices individually with Swiss QL. Christoph did a really interesting presentation, which, uh, especially time frame wise because I'm running really late, uh, I really can't show you how Darlene wants to kind of keep this under wraps a bit because it was definitely an interesting look into the future. It's kind of that teaser of this is why you should have joined us for a worldwide technology meeting um, and why it's worth going or, or at least virtually attending. Uh, but he actually talked, showed a prototype of what an ESX interface could look like. Talk about the different points of what we're used to already having inside of that. And what he showed is actually point one, is the GUI. Um, so a GUI that was all built in React um, and actually talked to an ESX underneath. Really interesting, wish y'all could see it. I'm sure it will be shared later this later next year in 2021. And then Jacques, one more thing. I'm going to steam through this one, uh, but very complex. Um, but what he showed is actually the GraphQL components in how they talk to the database, or how they're going to talk to the database. Um, so here, what you see is ESX with GraphQL under them. Those are all the tools for ES: the render engine, the twist tools. Um, any of those pieces are all these ESX pieces you see with GraphQL being API to them. The database is basically, and then the way you talk about it, we know database is kind of the memory, right? It holds all the information. It, it's interesting that the, for ESX, the database architecture itself is not gonna be changed. Some tables will be added, um, that's about it. It's also the nerve center because they're going to take advantage of what's called listen notify and Postgres and continuous query notifications on Oracle. 
which basically allowed the nodes, so all these microservices or services outside of the database, to communicate with each other through this whole list and notify uh, method inside of Postgres. So it's kind of what handles the caches. So you'll get stuff where the tools are basically talking to the database, uh, and the database is exchanging and sharing that information with the other nodes as well. So it's the heart because it's managing the task as well. So it's the queue, the table of the queue, and the services will be able to query that, find out what they need to work on, pick it up, and know whether there's another node that it's already picked it up or not. So that's where it's talking to the node, knowing basically being a traffic cop of all of that going on. So that communication will happen through GraphQL to the workflow services. And you'll see here where basically Kubernetes is put in. So if you have something you're running with containers, with Docker containers, what it'll be able to do is do something. And actually, I think I can read that slide. But basically, as these queue builds up, I need a preview, an input file, uh, approval, for instance. The workflow service will see that, say, I need to pick this up. Kubernetes is actually watching all of that. It knows that that queue builds up to a certain level based on the metrics that are defined in it. It needs to launch another node. And another node will jump in and immediately just start working and doing stuff. So completely dynamic uh, uh, infrastructure in a way. Um, so really built on what AWS is doing and Google's doing and trying to build these infrastructures with containers, be able to launch things quickly, scale up as needed, scale down as needed. And I know Graham's going to have a lot of fun figuring out the pricing model for this kind of stuff when you, if you're launching things dynamically, nodes to do more rendering. But we'll, we'll get to that in a couple of years, I'm sure. We'll have some interesting discussions. So talked about the kind of the uniqueness of uh, what they got to do with uh, with dialogue. And this slide got a little bit torn up because it's an animated slide. But dialogue is interesting because if one specific render engine picks up an image um, and someone zooms in on that image, you don't want another render engine to try to fulfill that submit. So they will actually communicate through each other, like we spoke about, and say, hey, I got this file. So if node two gets a request that needs a zoom, it actually makes the request from node one that has the file and then passes the image back up. So something they had to work out with uh, and have, are working on that kind of stuff and are able to do that through this architecture. So really interesting. So main thing, ESX is going to be fully container containerizable uh, using Docker, Kubernetes, and obviously other uh, uh, container uh, technologies as well. Database is the core. It's the central of everything. Um, and I think that's it. So again, uh, let's see uh, if there's any questions. Uh, Mike, if you're on there, any questions to go over? Yeah, there, there's a couple questions. Uh, first one is, uh, does ES6 support only Elasticsearch and Kibana 6, or does it also support uh, Elasticsearch 7? It does support Elasticsearch 7, and I think Alex is making that information available through the video he's going to be doing. In fact, I think uh, 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 so. didn't we decide that our recommendation would actually be to go with uh, Elasticsearch 7? Yeah, because Elasticsearch 6 is going to be end of life pretty soon. Uh, I think the reason Liam included it as the default is because uh, uh, if you're running an older version of ES you ha and you have an older index, uh, you have to basically convert that to, to a newer format so it can be read in Elasticsearch 7. So uh, if you don't do that before upgrading to Elasticsearch 7, your indexes, Elasticsearch physically won't start. So uh, I think they went with the older version to reduce instances of that. But uh, I'm working on a video. I'm going to try and get that out in the next week of uh, the upgrade procedure. If you don't freeze. Okay, yeah, the next question uh, had to do with that custom uh, desktop thing you showed for the uh, that was geared towards a dam. Mm -hmm. uh, 
is that sort of thing also available notably for users who need to work with a flat plan? Currently, no. Um, there's no, um, you know, it is a desktop. But at the end of the day, it's kind of a very enhanced desktop. Uh, I mean, a smart view inside the desktop. And to date, there's no smart view of a, a book plan, a flat plan. Um, so they are working on that supposedly. I, I asked a very similar question during the event itself. Okay, uh, two more. Uh, you discussed, especially at the end, a lot about ESX. Is there any time frame for when uh, even beta versions of that will start to be seen? I wouldn't expect to see a beta version until earliest end of 2022, um, more than likely inside of 2023. It's a, obviously it's a major, major development for them. They seem pretty far along, but there's just so much coding, so much that goes along with it. If I could have shown you Christoph Romer's presentation, he actually speaks about a bit of how much uh, coding is involved in this since they're completely writing the interface ground up. And following on from that, the piece that you discussed with the Twist microservices tools uh is it uh the fact that twist will really not exist apart from es at that point when when esx comes out that is correct there will be one product es the tools will be part of that product uh as far as how licensing goes on that with current owners of twist and that you know that's something that graham and us will work out obviously you're not going to lose your investment. Um, so, you know, that's not a concern. It would just be, uh, you know, achieved by being inside of the ES interface instead of what you're used to today, which was editor. Okay, that's it. Um, I think I see one more came in. Uh, does ES6 or... Oh, yeah, I see that. A complete fresh install or existing 5.5 setup can be easily upgraded. I believe 5.5. Uh, obviously, with ESX, I got a feeling. Well, although the database doesn't change, uh, so possibly there will be a, a, an upgrade path. Uh, but ES6 from ES5, you can upgrade. Our demo server is actually upgraded from it. You know, I show a demo server goes back to maybe four or five at one point. I'm not sure. Uh, we've talked about wiping it, but uh, but you can upgrade. There's an upgrade path. Elasticsearch is the caveat, not that with the stuff that Alex will document. Yeah, one other thing actually that might be good to mention, I need to send out a mailer on this, but uh, uh, if you're planning an ES6 upgrade or new hardware, uh, Red Hat announced last week that they're discontinuing CentOS. So uh, CentOS 7 is staying under its current support lifecycle where that's being end of life in mid 2024. Uh, CentOS 8, uh, they announced they're ending support for that in December 2021. So if you're staging a new ES or Twist server for ES6 or Twist 9, uh, your best bets right now are to use, uh, you could use uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8, which is uh, a paid product. Uh, you could use CentOS 7, but you'll have to restage the server after 2024 if uh, you want to receive uh, security updates. Uh, or you can use uh, Oracle Linux, which is uh, Oracle Linux 8, which is free. Uh, I've tested and that does seem to work. And long term, there is a uh, community project to build a replacement for CentOS out there, it looks like. So uh, there should be a, a more viable long-term replacement for that within the next year or so. Uh, I'll send out a mailer soon with uh, info on that. Just something to keep in mind if you're planning an upgrade. Definitely good information to bring up. And I did get a note from Graham as we were speaking that there will definitely be a migration path for current Twist users to ESX. So no concern there. We're just, we have to get further down the road to see what that actually means. Um, you know, as far as what TSX becomes. So hopefully that was interesting stuff for everybody. Sorry, I'm about uh, almost 12 minutes late. Uh, so much for trying to complete, uh, completely failed in trying to make this short. So everyone uh, look forward to join y'all joining us in the January webinar, uh, which we'll start planning soon. 
and hope everyone has a wonderful holiday season um, and stay safe. Uh, here's to a better 2021.